this kid is in. Welcome everyone to uh, the National Arts Hub uh, webinar, uh, Building Blocks of Leadership and Inclusion. My name is Neil Rodriguez. I'm a project manager here at National Arts Hub. And with me is uh, our executive director, Robin Phillips. You want to say hi, Robin? You're muted. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We're really excited to kick off uh, National RTAP's exploration of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we heard from you and the, re the review board and you that are our other uh, users. And there was a real interest in wanting more training to help you respond to these issues in your program. Uh, when I started looking for information, um, I didn't really find a roadmap that had a good teeth for our pro, you know, our people, for you, uh, that would really uh, sync, synchronize with smaller uh, rural and tribal programs. So Neil reached into his wealth of contacts, which many of you have had the benefit of, and we thought about getting an overview of the diversity, equity, and inclusion issues could help start our discussion uh, with the review board and you on what types of materials you could use uh, to. Uh, to assist you in developing and building a diverse, fair, inclusive transit program in your community. So Neil is going to introduce our launch team today with the building blocks of leadership and inclusion. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, you guys. Welcome. Thank you, Robin. Next slide. So before we get started, we'd like to go over some housekeeping and um, how to use Zoom webinar. Um, if you haven't by now, you'll see in the in the bottom corner of the Zoom window, there's a mute button, a audio button, and there's a, a option to either phone call in or use the computer audio. And uh, so there's that. And then uh, next slide, please. And also at the bottom, you'll see in the middle, there's the, uh, the chat option. You can go in there. If you have a question on, uh, uh, and how to use help using Zoom? Uh, ask ask it in there, and we'll have our staff who's who's monitoring uh, respond and, and provide assistance. And if you have questions for the panelists, you can uh, go into the uh, the, the Q and A um, option and go in there and type in a question. Uh, we're going to be monitoring that. And uh, there's actually a Q and A section at the end of this webinar that um, the panelists will will answer questions that, that have been asked. But also, if, if it's relevant to the, to the specific slide, they may or may not um, just chime in at that time. So we're, we're going to give the flexibility of this webinar. Next slide. So the National Arts Hub, we are the uh, Technical Assistance Center that is funded through the FTA, the Federal Transit Administration. We provide uh, training materials and technical assistance at no cost to rural and tribal transit providers and state arts Hub programs. We have a review board that includes members from the uh, state department of transportations and rural and tribal transit agency staff. So National Arts Hub has offices uh, in Massachusetts and DC and also uh, remote staff like myself. Um, to learn more, you can go to our website, nationalartshab.org and uh, visit our website. We have a wealth of information. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, introduction. Welcome everyone. Today our, presenter, our presenters are Ray Leonard Jr. and Dr. Joy Bloom Wright from Launch Team Consulting. Today they will share their personal stories of growing up with limited diversity and how their lives changed when confronted with it. The presentation will encourage the audience to celebrate diversity, work as cohesive teams, as well as discuss the effects that lack of diversity and inclusion have on organizations. Dr. Joy Wright is a graduate of the United States Military Academy and was a Naval Flight Officer for over seven years. She has a master's degree in psychology and a doctorate in organiz organizational development. She has over 17 years of experience in consulting, military, corporate sector, and nonprofits. Ray Leonard Jr. has over 20 years of experience as a sports agent, consultant, trainer, and motivational speaker. Ray has performed keynote addresses for training for many Fortune 500 companies, and he has worked with the Olympic organization the military, and many corporate organizations designing their training and management programs. Welcome everyone, uh, Joy and, uh, and Ray. 
Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate this and we really appreciate organizations doing this, this kind of training. So thank you so much for having us today. Um, our next slide talks about what is the point of this? Um, if you could turn to the next slide. And one of the things when we start any presentation is to make sure you know clearly what this is about. And we want to provide a clear understanding of diversity, inclusion, and culture. And what Ray and I try to do is give our personal background and stories um, to provide this understanding and then give tips and tools, uh, things that have worked, things we've learned the hard way. And um, I want to turn it over to Ray. I know Neil already introduced him, but we've worked together a long time. And I just wanted to add a few things before I turn it over. He's going to um, you know, sh uh, show you a, a video during his presentation and his background with his family. but. Um, Ray Jr. is a remarkable person. He's a motivational speaker, like Neil, Neil said, and he um, spoke to the military, which was near and dear to my heart, with uh, the sailors. And when he came out, the, the words he has to say and the wisdom and the things that he's learned through his life, I think really reach so many people. And I think that his background and his personal story really gets the point of diversity and inclusion um, to talk about how we can help people further and help organizations further. So uh, it's just an honor to work with him. I think that, uh, you know, besides being a coach to kids in the area and the community and helping so many people, uh, just remarkable athlete, uh, remarkable speaker and remarkable businessman. So I'm gonna turn it over to him. No pressure, Ray. <laughs> oh my <laughs> but, goodness. <laughs> but he's gonna tell you a little bit more about what the point of this and his personal story. So my, my twin sister and business partner has really <laughs> set the bar really high for me to come out and speak. But we like to talk about first about, you know, what is the point of this? When we're talking about diversity, equity and inclusion, you have to be built on a strong base. And that's why we call it the building blocks. So we have an exercise that we'll do that we'll talk about a little bit later. We can't do it on video or well, we probably could, but it wouldn't have the same effect. But when we're talking about diversity, equity, inclusion and, and the culture of workplaces and the culture of, of our society, uh, it's very important and it resonates with both of us. You know, why are we here? It's like to raise a greater awareness and sensitivity to diversity issues that go well beyond the assumed category. So not just race, but you no know, gender, uh, about you no know, cultural background, all these different things that we don't really look at. Uh, the race is always the biggest one, but there's so many other things that we have to consider when we want to create a culture that's inclusive of everybody. Now to recommend behavioral tools and foster a cohesive workplace, that's kind of our, our thing. That's what we wanna do you know, right here today. Uh, we're not gonna solve the world's problems today, but we'll give you a little bit more of our backgrounds and why we're passionate about this and why you should be passionate about it as well because it creates a more favorable workplace when you include everybody and you're able to use the skills of others. Now, my background, uh, my name is Ray Charles Leonard Jr. Um, my grandmother named me after the, the named my father after the singer Ray Charles. Uh, and she found out really quickly that my father couldn't sing. So that didn't work very well. So what happened was he went into boxing. And you no, know, some of you may know the boxer Sugar Ray Leonard. Uh, that's my father. And so you may see, have seen outside things about you know, my life because I grew up most of my life in the media on TV. But I want to give you a little bit more background into why diversity and inclusion is important to me. When I was born, I was in, born in uh, Palmer Park, Maryland. My mother was 15. My father was 16 years old. We had very uh, you know, meager beginnings. There was 14 of us to a two bedroom house and uh, no, nobody knew who we were. And uh, it was just, my block was my whole, whole future. Because sometimes when you live in a situation like that, you can't see outside of your, your space and everything that you're in. So that was kind of my thought process. And then all of a sudden in 1976, my father wins the gold medal in the Olympics. And things start to change pretty quickly because he became the golden boy. And um, you know we were all over the cameras and, and, and TV and everything. So living half my life in, in, in Palmer Park to see you know, one culture, and then all of a sudden I'm thrust into a situation where I'm seeing cultures from uh, all over the world and I'm meeting people all over the world it kind of opened my eyes to how important it is to understand not just my culture, but other people's culture. So when I was young, you know, we were in front of the camera quite a bit and the, all the conversations, we were trained to have certain, you know, kind of uh, words and things to say back to the media when they would come up. So, you know, if, 
there was always these three questions that people would ask me. They say, what was it like, you know, growing up as the son in, in the media, son of a, a famous boxer? I said, it was, no, it was cool. No, there were good and bad things. You know, the bad side was that I was always had people looking at me, um, you know, staring at me, had people jumping over our fence at our house. I had, uh, you know, death threats. I had uh, organizations that tried to kidnap me. Um, so that was the bad side. Uh, growing up, you know, when you're a young kid, that's kind of scary. But then on the other side, I got to meet, you know, so many amazing people. I got to meet Nelson Mandela. I got to dance on stage with Michael Jackson. I got to play Michael Jordan in basketball, and I beat him. <laughs> Everybody laughs at that at that story, but I did. I was about 12 years old. He came up to the house. Um, you know, I get the basketball. Uh, I shoot the ball up in the air. It goes in. He gets the ball, he goes right past me, he scores, and then I get the ball back and I shoot it in, and somehow it goes in again. I said, that's it, I'm not playing you no more. So I win, <laughs> four to two, that's it, that's it. So that's that's part of my story. But then the other situation that they ask me all the time is, is you know, why didn't you box? Why did you go into training? Um, and did you ever fight your father? So, you know, I played football, I was a two sport athlete in college. I played football and ran track and field at Ohio University. and. You know, one of the biggest things for me was that, you know, uh, when I got big enough to challenge my father, I wanted to come home and challenge him. So after my freshman year, I went from 155 pounds as a senior in high school to 185 pounds as a freshman uh, at the end of my freshman year in college. And I got back home and I wanted to challenge my father. I said, yeah, come on, Pop, let's go down and fight. And he said, you do know what I do for a living, right? I said, yeah, I know all your moves though, so it's good. So I get downstairs and we go at it and I'm rushing and he's, I'm throwing punches and he's just moving out the way. I was like, oh, this is gonna be a long day. So instead of me actually explaining to you what happened, let me show you what he actually does for a living and give you more background. So can you play the video? Okay, so needless to say, that didn't really go well for me. Um, I, and, uh, that was the end of my boxing career. I took my gloves off and I got into uh, the corporate world and doing training. But <laughs> <laughs> one of the greatest experiences of my life was being able to travel around the world. I got to travel to many different countries from, from Africa to China, to Japan, to Russia and meet people of all over. And that kind of gave me a true appreciation appreciation of, of everyone's background and, and the diversity that everyone brings. And to see how organizations, me running organizations myself, to see you know, how it, it impacts an organization to have people of different thought processes and different cultures to make things better uh, because we're, we're, we're a, a big breadbasket of, of all different kinds of people. So um, my passion has been you know, for my kids, my grandfather told me when I was younger, if when you know better, you do better. And so that's kind of been my passion, what leads me trying to move forward to, to make a better world. And that's why there's a passion for me to talk about you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion for all. So I'm gonna turn it over to my brilliant uh, business partner, Dr. Joy Wright, and my twin sister, as I said. And you know, you, you'll, you'll hear why, I mean, we're fraternal, you know, we're not 
identical. But you'll you'll understand a little bit more why as she talks about her background. And there's so many different similar things that are similar with us than brings us apart. So Dr. Joy. Thank you, Ray. Um, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and um, I grew up in a predominantly white area. And but I was blessed to have parents that um, and I think of organizations when you have leadership that teaches and empowers people and gives people the full chance because I always look at and read about diversity but when you think about organizations and inclusion you're taking it that step further where someone doesn't just feel like they can go to work but they feel like they can go to work and be empowered and have their you know the, the needs met at the job and things like that so I feel like I had that growing up in in Alabama Birmingham Alabama with both of my parents they uh, taught all six kids in our family um, all about inclusion and what that means. And even though, you know, on this slide um, that all communication is filtered through your cultural perspective. So if you look at uh, background, a lot of times we say, okay, well, this is someone's background. They're not exposed to a lot of diversity, but I still think from a leadership perspective, and for me, it was my parents at a young age, they taught us that for Ray, it was traveling around the world. And so both of us living in our homes maybe weren't initially exposed to a lot of diversity, but it's that life experience or reading or, or going further to, um, to educate yourself that we really learn about this. So I think that just because we don't have a background in diversity or diversity inclusion, there's still that level and that's why we do these trainings because I feel like you can be impacted by one person, one manager, one supervisor, one leader, one parent, one foster parent, whoever it is, that person can impact someone to make a difference from an inclusive um, environment that they can go to work in or live in. And, and for me growing up in that environment with my parents, maybe I didn't see it at a day-to-day -day basis from school, um, but my parents taught us that at a young age, like I said, all six kids. And those things have stayed with me. My parents passed away in 2016 and 2018. And while they were alive, we thank them for that. Because when I went off at 18 years old to the United States Naval Academy, um, my you know, background from this perspective, you know, I had the, the athletic background and the education and uh, things like that that I grew up with. But that background with understanding in inclusion at a young age really helped me and it gave me a passion to want to train in this environment. So, um, you know, I went through the Naval Academy. Oh, I got, I got, I got to tell the story. So <laughs> Joy, it's like, she's very humble when she talks, but all of her siblings or doctors or, or, or lawyers or whatever, I mean, they're just brilliant, brilliant family, brilliant people. And she was one of the first women to integrate aircraft carriers in the Navy. It was like her and 4,999 men. So talking about trying to feel inclusive in that kind of situation. So she has firsthand experience. <laughs> well, thank you, Ray. Um, so after the Naval Academy, after I graduated and I went to flight school and I was uh, trained to be a, a navigator and a Naval flight officer in the F-14 Tomcat. Um, and so one of my first duty stations was to, like he's saying, to integrate one of the aircraft carriers. And I checked on board and um, I initially was obviously very nervous. I would be lying to say I went by, you know, on there with confidence. I had confidence in my training in aviation. I had confidence in my background at the Naval Academy, but all of a sudden, you know, I'm checking on board on this aircraft carrier and things came back to me of what my parents said. And it was obviously, you know, on my end was I was prepared. I was prepared to be a division officer. I was prepared to lead. But the other side of it is remembering things like one of the things on this slide is communication style and communication. So knowing that I was the first person going on, that's why training is so important is if we're able to communicate and open up sessions where people can ask questions, which we'll get to if y'all have any questions, you can ask us um, at the end or throughout this presentation, they can add it up so we can help, you know, anything that you want to address but also um, having an environment where you allow that so that people aren't uncomfortable because I had so many questions when I went on board and a lot of it was fear. I had one um, chief come up to me and say, 
I am so afraid to talk to you because I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to offend you. I don't. And I said, you know, by you coming up to just talk to me and be honest and say that is part of the training process because this is how we make changes and we make an environment where you're empowering people to work. And so um, what I felt in those in that training is the leadership did a great job with making me feel empowered to do my job and division. Now, like Ray said, with over 4,000 people on a carrier, I would be lying to say that there weren't things that happened or incidences where I could have felt not welcome. Or I would hear my mom, who, as I told you from Alabama and her Southern voice, I could hear it almost in my ear on the carrier with the, the red lights at nine on the aircraft carrier and we we're at underway. And I could hear a voice saying, Joy, don't get too close to the edge of that aircraft carrier. They might, those boys might fall, throw you overboard. And so in my mind, it was, okay, there might be someone that does not want me on this aircraft carrier. And, uh, you know, I, I was so excited as, a, as a, a new officer to go out and do my job. But I also had that side of my, my mom saying, your safety, you know? And so I think that that is the biggest thing in a workplace. We can say we can create an environment that's, that is diverse, but we have to take it to the step of inclusive, which means you feel that you're empowered at work, that you feel comfortable to do your job. You don't feel like you're going to get thrown overboard on an aircraft carrier. Uh, and that might be an extreme situation, you know, when, in a workplace. But if you think of that analogy, nobody should ever feel like they come into an office and they're not say right right and, and, and there are the examples in your life where you feel like that environment didn't create that for you yeah so i mean why does it matter now i mean how does that translate you know our stories how does that translate into the corporate world or, or translate into your organization it translates because there are people from all different backgrounds that you're going to work with and you know, from your, your story and your background is, is going to you know, have kind of the feel to your, your thought process and the communication that, that you have, because it, it's, you know, sometimes it's all you know. Like when I first talked about me growing up in Palmer Park, Maryland, where I saw nobody that looked different than me. I mean, everybody was, was, was brown and, uh, you know, uh, athletes pretty much. I mean, it, it, was, it was a whole you know, situation where everybody was, was you know, in this and from the same culture and then when you get thrust into having to work with people from other cultures uh it can be easy to to be scared uh because that's what a lot of the miscommunications come from is fear and uh it, it's you know the, the thought process is not being able to communicate well with others so you know the big thing nowadays is trying to understand everybody trying to have that communication trying to walk a mile in their shoes and find out how your teammates can work best with you because when you're in the military. When Joy talks about her being in the military, you, you can't really care about the person that's that's uh, beside you because you want them to shoot and protect you too, right? Right. <laughs> so that, that that conversation, just when I played sports on a football team, I didn't care really care about the background of anybody. I cared about could they do their job. And uh, as it went along, the more I got to know each person, you know, I, I, I began to to represent and feel their culture and understand why they did certain things. So it made it a much more cohesive kind of situation. Right, and I think that in sports, it's very easy to see that. Like I, I played soccer and did track in college at the Naval Academy and Ray did track and football. Uh, we both talked about our, our, our college background. And I think that like what he's saying and you've heard the analogies of different positions when you look at the football field or the soccer field, um, there are so many different positions and the players are very diverse in their ability and levels and size, shape, whatever you want to talk about in the field, but they come together as a cohesive team and the best teams out there are that way. Is You know, when I think of the teams that I've played with, whether it was in high school or middle school or at the Naval Academy or all Navy soccer when we played beyond the academy, um, it was that team that worked together and provide that team or, and, and why do we even bring this up in business? Um, you know, we think about, obviously we want it to be a safe place and people to feel good about going to work and going to the job. But from, from a business aspect, it makes the, the team and the organization more productive in whatever job they're doing, whether it's sports, whether it's a sales team, whether it's a, a transportation uh, side of the house, all of those areas are going to be more productive if the people feel safe and comfortable and happy going to work. 
Right. Right. And, and you got to think about it. I mean, we all have our, our you know, preconceived biases that, you know, come from our background or whatever, what we've learned with, within life. And, you know, it's it's easy to think that here, you no, know, I may maybe I, you know, I, I just didn't like this person for this reason. You no, know, but at work, you have to get along. You have to be able to work with, with someone no matter what their background is. And you have to respect the, each, each person uh, because they're individuals and they're, you know, they're trying to help all of us get to a certain goal. You know, in a company, everybody's trying to get to the same goal to have, you know, a, a good life, to have, you know, profitability from the company and the organization and to, to go to work. I mean, when you, you go to work, you spend most of your life at work, at work and in, in sleep. So you want to have an environment that's that's fun, that environment that you're, that you're, that you're friendly with, that you're comfortable with. And it, it's a terrible thing when you make somebody feel bad because of their race, because of their religion, because of their national origin, because of their disability, their gender. Uh, and, and it doesn't make sense because if you think about it, when you put two little babies, little kids together and they're playing in the sandbox, they're, they don't, really don't have any issue with each other. They just want to say, here, you didn't take my sand or you didn't take my toy away from me. You know, they they, they want to have fun and play together. There is no preconceived notions that they have, but those are learned behaviors. So how do we overturn and change that culture within our, with our, within our, within our community and within our you know, uh, world? And so that's why training is so important and understanding tools. We had a question which pertains to this and I wanted to bring it up now was, um, how did fear play into your job performance? And I know Ray and I both have examples of this. And, and for me, um, one of them was that I obviously um, going back a little bit in college, which was before I became an officer, but it was uh, still, I was doing a job at the academy as a midshipman. Um, and so uh, what happened was I was a brand new plebe and I was standing out in the hall and we do these come arounds where they can yell at you, your upper class. And there are things that are loud. So you know, the guys, everybody's getting yelled at, getting, uh, they're being asked to do push-ups and nothing, none of that was unfair. We were all being treated the same with, with respect to that. And then I had one um, a guy, a, a second class midshipman, which would be a junior that pulled me back out in the hallway. And the only person that could see the two of us, um, I thought was my roommate and another female, but there was a diagonal, which I had another um, male classmate that could see as well. And he kind of got in my face. And what he did was he was, he knocked my cover, which is the hat you have to wear. Um, and he knocked it off my head, but he hit my head as he did it. Now, at, at the time, one of the things before I went into the Naval Academy that uh, a family friend had told us was just fit in, kind of fly under the radar, don't bring the attention to yourself. So when it happened, I went back in my room, tried to hold back tears because I definitely didn't want to call attention to myself. And um, my roommate was like, that is not okay. And I did not want to bring it up, you know, to anybody, but the, the guy was known to do that just to some of the females. And neither my, my roommate nor I wanted to do something. And it was the male classmates that saw it that ended up saying something that that's not okay. He can't hit you in the hallway. And, you know, I was 18 years old, right out of Alabama, scared to death. But what it did while I was waiting for anybody to do it, anything about it from a fear perspective, I, I, was, I was terrified and it took me down a level where I had so much confidence walking into induction day of the Naval Academy. And all of a sudden, you know, two weeks into it, this guy has taken that, I, I was allowing him almost to take that away from me. And it, what, what happened, and this is when I think of leadership, even though this was a peer, to me, that was a leader that stepped in and did something about it at the time. And it made a difference in the rest of the time I was there. Um, and the guy got training. He didn't get kicked out, but he did get taught, you know, talked to by the company officer. And I think a lot of things have changed and that obviously wouldn't be allowed now. Um, but it did put a level of fear in, in me that affected my performance those next few days. And I, and I, I let it because I didn't, I didn't feel safe in that environment. Yeah. And when, when you talk about fear, you know, being a, a part of it, I mean, we've all felt uncomfortable in our work situations and in certain different environments, we felt uncomfortable, right? Uh, you know, whether it was blatant or whether it was just perceived because we all have, you know, the, the, these, these certain fears and things that are inside of us. I remember to talk about a situation of fear for me as when I started working in the financial services area, I was working for a big Wall Street firm. Um, you know, all, we all came in, young, young folks came in together and there was a certain thought process from me and a, a couple other guys that looked like me 
and a young lady that looked like me that we had we were expected to do a lot more than our counterparts and uh, we were being held to a different standard so it wasn't an evil even playing field so every time we came back to have our reviews it was you know you should have done better uh, i may have been you know, one or two thousand dollars behind this person in our goal and it said you should have done better because of this and then i come back the next time it motivates me to say okay here i'm going to be better because i have to be better which it shouldn't be a, a factor into your head when you're working in that kind of environment but we've all we've all felt it we've all dealt with it and you, it's uncomfortable you don't like to deal with it and how do we change that factor how do we change that in the world and that's one of the things we talk about when we're training we do it over and over again and sometimes it's uncomfortable but like if you're in sports or boxing something like that we train because we want to create what we call muscle memory so when you have those high stress situations or issues that come up we want to react and when we have the opportunity to be leaders we want to make sure that we create a vir environment as a leader that's conducive to everybody feeling comfortable to be able to work at their best and Ray just, uh, the word he just said, everybody. I think that's so important. And sometimes we miss that point of um, when we look at an environment of uh, inclusion, we want it to be everybody, all, not just some. You know, not, you, you don't want it to be some people feel comfortable or included in that work environment or um, that organization. You want it to be all and everybody. And th those words are so important when you look at um, inclusion that it, you know, you might say that, okay, I've included these four people. And I think, I think that's really important to always keep in mind. Another question that came up um, or a statement was when we're talking about, we already addressed the fear that you can experience, whether it's in you know, whatever organization you're in where you've experienced something that makes you afraid to go to work. And like Ray said, it can be blatant, like someone hitting you on the head, um, or it can be very like, you, you know, just kind of, you feel like somebody's talking about you. And uh, both of those make you feel uncomfortable when you're walking around your workspace. And analogy I always like to give when you're thinking about, let's say you have a new, new position and you're a leader in that position. Um, my parents used to say this, when you have host an event at your house, like you're hosting a birthday party or your sign, uh, Ray's son just signed to play football in college and they did a signing. Um, when you do that event and you come to the front door of that person's house and they open the door, uh, you in about 30 seconds feel whether you're welcome there or not welcome there. And at Ray's house, I walk in the door and I always feel welcome. And I think vice versa, right? Yeah, yeah. The entire family from um, his mother-in-law to uh, his mom, to, to his wife, to your dogs, to your, um, I might have to give him a treat or two, but yes, your dogs and, and your kids. But um, so you feel that 30 seconds where immediately you feel welcome. And so the reason why I'm bringing up this point is a statement that was made in the, in the comment section is your communication and your interaction with your coworkers is so important and you want that productive communication. That's why um, kind of mediated training is important because a lot of times when we're getting through understanding each other, there might be a little chaos before we get to clarity. And so a lot of times Ray and I will mediate those. Uh, but I think that communication is so important and effective a communication. Right. Um, we've talked a lot about that. If you want. Yeah. I mean, you talk about, you know, what is your organization built upon? Like what, like, what, what do you represent when you hear about different you know, organizations or you hear like the Patriots, you know, from the, in the NFL and you say, okay, their organization is different. They don't you know tolerate this. They go after certain kind of people. They got people that have this certain thought process. Every organization doesn't have that. I mean, I know, you know, sometimes when you walk into a job or you work and walk into an environment and you're like, oh, you know what? This is, this is kind of a cold environment. This is not what I'm used to. So what are the building blocks of that organization? Like, like, we talk about the building blocks because of the base. You all, everything starts with a strong base. You know, if you have a strong base, it makes it easier to build upon. So that's when we talk about when you're training and you're trying to you know, get to yourself to change the organization and change the culture of, of, of our society. It has to be built on something other than just talk. You know, I always talk to organizations. I say, do you want to put a Band-Aid on a, on a problem or do you want to actually solve it? And if you want to solve it, it's going to be hard work. You got to start. You got to build your base. You got to build a culture that includes everybody. And it's going to take some time because people have to relearn some things. You know, or, or, or people that think they know <laughs> may not know exactly what their biases are and the issues are. So sometimes you got to bring it to attention. 
And that's what we try to do from the exercise that we call the building blocks of, of leadership and inclusion. And Joy, you want to tell a little bit about that, that exercise that we do? Uh, yes, we, an example you know, of our Jenga we, game. We, yeah, we're still not seeing everybody to you know together. I mean, hopefully we'll, we'll all be together closely soon and we can actually do live uh, events again. You know, <laughs> uh, But this, these are one of the exercises that we talk about when we uh, you know, move forward. Because we built a giant one of these to get really the perspective of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. We built a whole bunch of big, big blocks like the Jenga game. So... So um, one of the things when we're doing training is sometimes you get the slide, like the last slide we just showed, where it talks about we form, you know, our thought processes based on our age and national origin and race and sexual orientation. And you can look at all the things all the way down to military experience, philosophical perspective. Look at this list of things that form our opinion. So now if you go to the next slide with the building blocks, uh, Ray and I, uh, we understand that it's built on that. So now where do we take it? We, we go into an organization and we know people come from these diverse backgrounds. And on an aircraft carrier of over 4,000 people in my Navy commands of, of diverse background. And what I uh, and Ray have found both in our workplaces and that's what we found, even though I had the military and corporate background and he had sports and entertainment and corporate background, they were both very similar when it comes to this. and. It, uh, that is the leadership, what leadership plays. And a leader does not have to be your top person. A leader can be anybody in that organization. A leader can be someone that stands up when they see something that isn't right. right. Um, so uh, the building blocks of leadership and diversity and the analogy we talked about, and I think it is very easy for like, if you visualize the Jenga game and if you played that and you look at the slide, it's the children's game that has the wooden blocks that stand up and you pull a block out one at a time and you basically try to make the next person topple over the structure. Now, when we think of an organization, we wanna think of that in an opposite way. We wanna think that we're not trying to make the person topple the organization over. We're doing just the opposite. We want to be a cohesive, a cohesive team that keeps that structure up together. But where the blocks come in, and when you think of the analogy, it's the comments that make us feel afraid or feel like we're unwanted or feel like we're not equal in the organization. And both Ray and I have experienced that. We would be lying to say that we've gone, um, you know, yeah. this many years to say that it hasn't happened. Right. So, so, how, so how do you deal with that when you have like a coworker that doesn't communicate well and uh, you're having issues and you have to work together, but you're like, okay, do you go tell the manager? Or if, you, if you tell the manager, you worry about the manager not actually responding in the correct way. How do you address that situation? Okay, so um, we in the military learned at a, you know, really early on is our chain of command, you know, and um, what we found, though, is sometimes that chain of command can be hostile. So you could start, I always tried to handle things at the very uh, lowest level possible. So you're my peer, and you've said something, you don't even realize that it was hurtful to me, or I've said something to you, you I don't realize it's hurtful. And it, we address that to each other. And the, um, this has happened like on the aircraft carrier and the commands I've been in and, and not just, it's happened both ways. You know, it's not just something said to me, it might be me saying something I didn't even realize was, uh, and so we talk about it. And a lot of times you'll get, I did not realize that. Oh my gosh, I didn't even realize, but I can completely see where you're coming from as far as what I just said and how I, will, and I immediately changed that. So we are communicating that, right? right. Um, now I might go to Ray and he laughs at me, I've just said the comment, now Ray would never do that, but you laugh and it's become hostile. Like there's nothing I can say. And my mom in that example would say, gently distance yourself and it would be the next person. So, and that's what I mean. Like you don't want to take, to me, I wouldn't go straight up to the skipper of my squadron and say, this just happened to me. Um, it, you know, if it's a communication issue that we can talk about. Um, and, and obviously there's protocol in any organization for safety issues that this is not going to work, you know, where we're going to communicate. And I know, and that's why Ray was talking about the building blocks, your organization's training manuals and your protocol for how you address things is very important. And, and having those in an organization 
um, is very important so that you have that quote chain of command. So going to the uh, building blocks, do you want to talk about an example of one of the comments? And yeah, well, I mean, when, when, you, when you're talking about you know your, your culture and your organization and the changing the way the organization moves forward, sometimes it, it's it's not going to be super easy. You know, if you have people that have been there, or you have a manager that doesn't pay attention the correct way, you're going to ha maybe have to if you you work with it over and over again and you're not getting the results that you need, um, you may have to go to the next person uh, to try to try to get that situation corrected. Uh, you don't want to start there, like Joy was talking about. You want to try the, the, the least uh, barrier of, uh, of conflict that you can, first and foremost, but then keep going on because you, it, you have to change the organization. You have to change the way you feel. If you have to go to work every day and you're working with somebody that's uncomfortable and they don't understand why it's important for you guys to work together, you have to change that or you have to move on. And, you know, you prefer to be able to change it because, you know, a lot of times it's the job that we love or it's the uh, career that we love. And if we don't change the culture of where we are, if we're not a part of it, first reflecting on us and saying, what am I doing to help this situation? Then, yeah, you have to have to continue to move forward and try to find, you know, the solution that's going to make a difference. And it starts with the with leadership and, and reflect on each one of us to say, I'm doing my job now. By DYJ, that's what I say when I'm coaching kids, do your job first and foremost, and then move on, and then everything else is going to take care of itself. So when we're talking about the building blocks and talk about the comments and issues and different things, um, you know, say if I'm, I'm in a situation and I you know, talk about somebody's uh, race or background in a joking situation, and I think it's a funny joke, and but it makes them feel uncomfortable, you know, within the whole community, within the whole organization. How do I reflect on myself and say, how can I change that? Because I don't want something to feel uncomfortable, just like I wouldn't want to feel uncomfortable myself when I'm going to work. So that's when you that when you do that, you're taking a piece of the organization and you're making the organization less strong when you're doing that and you create an environment that's uncomfortable for somebody else to work in. So you had another, we had a statement or comment. Yeah, right? um, I was just reading it. it uh, do you want to read this one real quick? And Yeah. yeah. I'll say uh, in a lot of cases, even diverse members of organizations can have intercultural issues. For example, a white manager might hesitate to discipline or correct a minority employee that causes problems for others. What steps can we take individually to reduce the hostility in a work environment? I think consistency. Um, so I rotated around as a division officer, you know, on the aircraft carrier. And I think that um, no matter who the manager is, if we're consistent with our rules, and I know that that is very difficult, but if we stop doing that, then that can also create an environment where that, you know, people don't feel inclusive. So I think being consistent on how you treat your, you know, like on an aircraft carrier would be division one, division two, division three of your, um, so that division officer, how they're treating that person. So VO division officer is treating them equally. Um, I think that that's very important. And um, if that doesn't happen, the, the when we're looking at these building blocks, it could be comments or it could be something else. That is what pulls out that that wooden block to make it unstable. And it makes that that organization or division not stable temporarily. And if you keep getting these kind of comments, eventually that topples over. And so that's why this is, you know, besides the person's feelings and all of that, to address the issue of the organization doesn't function at the highest level if, if not everybody in that organization feels cohesive to work together. So I, I think that um, for me, and I went through a lot of environments where, where I was the only female going through my F-14 initial training down in Pensacola, Florida, I was the only female in that, that squadron. My second squadron, same thing on the aircraft carrier. And I know there were numerous, um, and in my instances, it was gender. So numerous males where if I messed up at something, I know that they were initially hesitant to correct that. And, uh, and so for me, that was part of the, you know, part of the training process. And when I was on the aircraft carrier, these are things I brought up. I, you know, I brought up, um, you know, when they're integrating the aircraft carrier, bring on a team, maybe not one person. Um, and uh, uh, different things like that. But the other important thing about training is intent. So if someone comes to you and you can tell their intent is genuine, but they might've, what, what they said verbally might've not 
uh, can you explain that further, like intent with um, with comments and correcting things? Yeah, I mean, maybe something that was that was being said or or done wasn't meant. The intent wasn't to offend somebody, but it, it actually actually did. And so when you're an organization or when you're a person in leadership that understands, okay, I, I may not have had the intent of that, and the other person, you can explain to them that hey, that I didn't have the intent to do that, but I apologize for doing it, and I, I won't happen again. When Joy talked about the consistency in every single organization, you know, on, on a football field, if, if I let one person just kind of run around, run, run, uh, you know, and do their own thing, they may be from a different background or a different culture. And I may have a fear to say, if I say something to them, then it'll come back on me. But if, if I had it consistent with every single person, they, they look back in the track record and say, this is what he does. Like, this is how he responds to you. And this is the expectation. And the expectation is, is how the culture moves forward. And that's when you create a culture that everybody understands and everybody respects and appreciates. When you respect their culture that says here, no, there isn't going to be you know, different rules for different people. Like here's the rules. And once you start to see that, you want to show that in your organization, people will appreciate that more. Yeah. And I found that if I was treated differently, like um, you know, the, initially when we were doing the obstacle course training, um, when I was a new brand new officer, they took out the wall, the, the females didn't have to go over the wall. And I asked if I could do it because I felt like I don't want, I didn't want to be treated differently because it called that attention that I didn't want to myself as far as doing something, you know, that, that stood out uh, differently from a perspective as far as training, that that should be equal. And um, so I think that when you're looking at an organization, uh, consistency, but also, and we help a lot of organizations with this where um, making sure your guidelines, like what your rules are, are clear, like they're clearly stated and communicated because you might have it in a book somewhere and that will make that leader's job very easy because if the, your, your, your protocols and your, your tips and tools that are in place at your organization are very clearly put out there, if, well, whoever that manager is, whatever that manager looks like, whoever they are, um, if they're following that consistent you know, base, which is where this building blocks is, that's what they bring up. They don't call, there's no other attention brought to that person on their, what their diverse background is or what their, whatever it is, it's sticking to the consistent rules of that organization. So, so what happens when the, when the leaders or the management are the ones that's creating an environment that's not, that's a toxic environment that doesn't have the culture? And so that's where I think a training is, is, you know, we bring back the training comes and you said it's sometimes hard work. Um, you know, Ray and I did a lot of work, you know, with the military and sometimes it was very painful for us to watch to see, you know, we would do the junior officer training and we would do the senior leadership training and to find where the, we could very quickly see um, where that, that what, where the issue was. And, um, and that comes with training because when Ray talked about, um, you know, looking at the diverse backgrounds, and we have that slide in here that says we form these opinions based on this. And I have uh, two 18 year olds and a 20 year old, but my two 18 year olds are in social media. And I tell them all the time, you know, you, you have these platforms and a big base of, of people listening to you. And I know that you're very passionate, but also understand intent and how you put things out there and research, 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 research um, before you just, you know, copy and paste something. And so I, I think that um, from a training perspective, if it's the leaders that are toxic, I think that we continue the training. Um, the, the members of that organization can request it, like you're talking about, there's mm -hmm. protocols to request it. And I think like for this organization today, doing what you're doing right now is part of the half the battle and but there's more that's needed yeah, right and, and for you know the 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 average employee or the average teammate uh, joyce's sons are, are super tiktok stars so she's being very modest with that but for the average employee or for the average uh you know uh teammate or person that's out there sometimes you believe that you can't make a change like you believe that 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 your voice doesn't matter because here's it's all about the leadership but sometimes if you pull together and you decide to hear, we're gonna create an environment, uh, it, it forces the organization to change. You know, that, that's, what, that's one of the things that we talk about, about the internal change. 
because everybody else wants to do that. You know, we had a situation and way, way back when, when my, my kids were, were young because my kid was going to school with Joyce kid. And there was a situation where someone came in with, with a comment. Another kid came with a comment and said something about him. And Joyce kids jumped up immediately and started saying, no, no, that's not true. Oh, you, you don't, don't move like that. Joy, you want to tell a story a little bit? Um, so um, we have a couple of them, right? Yeah. So one of them was, this is elementary school and um, Ray's son liked a girl, a white girl, and another boy in the class said, I think they were third or fourth grade, mm -hmm. third grade maybe, third grade, yeah. and um, basically said, you're not allowed to date, you can't like her, you can't date her because uh, she's white, and you're not, and so uh, Jalen just kind of stood there and didn't know what, you know, what to say to the person, and uh, my son Jack, one of the twins, stepped in and said, you know, that is, that is not okay at third grade. And, um, you know, the, the follow-up, the, the yard duty or the noon duty that was watching all of this said she was going to step in and obviously correct them until she heard the two of them. And then Jalen kind of stepped in with Jack and they both explained. And then Jack said, well, first of all, we're not white, we're peach. And uh, they went with their own third grade explanation. But the point is, they stood up for each other and it made it very easy for Jalen um, and for both of them. And then the child even looked at him and goes, oh, okay. And unfortunately, I think he had learned it. He said his parents, right? Right, right. So when we talk about, you know, where, you know, the how we communicate and it's filtered through our own cultural perspectives and backgrounds, sometimes we have to be able to speak up and explain to people, like, this is not right. This is, this is uncomfortable. I don't feel like that. And this is why. And a lot of times that can resolve part of the issue. And, you know, when you have people that, that bond together to say, okay, this, this is the kind of environment that we want. Uh, a lot of times everybody else says either they're either leave because they, they can't get, get with it, that the culture is this way, or they'll you know, start to, to, to say, okay, I'm accepting of this and I want to know more. And I think once we have a more inquisitive kind of lifestyle and culture and community, I think we're going to be much better off and we're able to talk and communicate much better with each other. Exactly. And I think that um, when you're looking at training and communication within an organization, um, you know, I think that you don't have to be the, the top person to suggest some types of training. When I was on the aircraft carrier and I, you know, I told you I just checked on board and um, a, a couple of months had gone by and there was a lot of training on how to receive me. You know, so um, talking about gender and a lot of focus on what the, the sailors already on board the carrier were supposed to do. And one of the things I suggested was um, training for them to ask me questions too, or open up a level of communication because they were, I had heard enough where I'm afraid to talk to you or I'm afraid I'm gonna say something wrong. And I, I felt bad about it because I'm like, if we just had that open line of communication, I could put them, in e and put them at ease to know that we can work together. And the other thing I've told my kids, because we know that people come from that, you know, backgrounds, there are some behaviors we cannot excuse, like obviously violence and things like that. But when I talked about intent, sometimes someone's background, they say things and they think it's funny and it's, it's offensive. And so a, a, a way to communicate and teach that person might be, you know, the, the, where you, that person is able to be a productive member of the team because they learn from you. Yeah. And we found that there are some people that you can never teach and they're, they end up not in the organization, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they just kind of wash themselves out. But a lot of times, the way Joy and I like to train, I mean, I, I know some, some trainings get, get uh, you know, uh, frustrating and you go through and you're like, I just want to do this. I'm going to write it out and I'm going to just click through. But we do a style called edutainment. I mean, we like to make it uh, fun, you know, from, from when, you, when you can make it fun, but also have an environment where you're, you're learning but you're also, it's something that you're engaged in that you wanna do. And as you continue that move forward, it is it's a lot easier to, to, to do it when you're saying, okay, here, this is something that, I, that I'm focused on and I know why it's important rather than just saying, I just gotta go through it and finish it off. Um, so I think we, we get to any questions. Um, you know, I think we got some more questions coming on. Um, we'll do a little, a little Q and A here. Okay, an anonymous attendee. So our, can you read these? So our cultural perspectives is open uh, or, they, uh, cultural perspectives oh, as open or closed as they might be are actually building blocks or for inclusion and diversity. You're right. You're right. You're talking about the cultural perspectives. Yes, uh, being, absolutely. Being, being part of the building blocks. 
A absolutely. So we bring these backgrounds and we learn from each other. And part of that diverse team that makes it so beautiful, like, I, you know, I keep the sports analogy and you've probably heard it before, but you look at um, just the diversity on a team and we brought this up earlier, they wouldn't function if you didn't have the running back and the offensive lineman and the defensive line. So if you think of it in that perspective, a diverse work workforce is great. Now take it a step forward in the inclusion side where you empower people because if everybody is empowered on a team, that team is going to be more productive. Right. right. Um, but we do have to be patient with each other as we learn from each other. Because a lot of times we just don't understand something. Like Ray and I have constantly, we constantly ask each other questions, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and here, and there's a question here that, you know, talks about how do you open up lines of communication? You know, uh, if you have a, a coworker, then how do you approach a coworker to, with the intent of educating them and inform them rather than criticize because that that's that's a big thing you know if you say something to somebody they may think you're trying to criticize them rather than saying here i want you to know about my culture so i think it's how you start you know like um a lot of the training ray and i do is on on communication effective communication and so uh for me on the aircraft carrier it went both ways like sometimes i was very scared to, to approach them to say that just offensive, but I realized I was in a position to train and whoever came on board after me needed to have a safe environment. So it made it easy for me to say, and I would, I, what, the way I would address it is, I don't, you know, I don't think you meant this like offensively or so like, it's your, it's your body language. It's what you, how you present it to them. Right. right, right. And, uh, but can you help me understand this? Uh, and don't point it at them. So you're, you're, can you help me understand this? I have a question about this. And like I said, Ray and I do that to each other all the time. Yeah, it, I, it I, don't, I, don't up, I don't come up to Joy and say, hey, Joy, you don't understand the black experience. <laughs> no, exactly. No, you, yeah, so let me let me tell you about it. <laughs> I'll say here, no, let, let me share something with you about, about, you know, what I go through and why I think this way. Exactly. You know, would, would you be open to hear that? You know, to try to understand me a little bit more. And, and like saying that I know how you feel because you don't know exactly how anybody feels, but saying, can you help me? And that, and like I said, with intent, it's someone's intent. And sometimes we are, you know, something has happened to us and we feel that hostility that it's hard to do that. It's so hard to open up that line of communication, but the more you do it and the more the organization is able to allow that safe environment, the people that are not that are not uh, don't have good intent. They will eventually go out of the organization. So creating a safe, non-hostile environment actually fosters this, right? Yeah, right. Um, where you have that open dialogue. And do we? Is there another question? We yeah. Yeah. I mean, once once you open that line of communication up, and and, and you do it from you know what I found is is from an inquisitive standpoint. You know, here I, I want I want you to know a little bit more about me. We have to work together. You know, I want you to know a little bit more about me and why I think the way I think. So maybe that will help us communicate better. You know, some things like that. You know, when you come from a way of asking a question and open the doors up to give, you know, make somebody more informed about you and why you think this way. A lot of times that makes the conversation easier and then it opens up the dialogue back and forth on both sides, you know, and it makes it much easier. I mean, I have that issue sometimes with my wife and she starts talking about the dishes. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a hard conversation to have, but she's like, there, let me explain to you why I need you to do the dishes and why that's going to help me. Then it makes sense to me. <laughs> exactly. And um, I think that we, we've added the, the thing with social media and technology and stuff and things can get lost in communication. And so that's why I think opening up a safe environment where there is effective communication, um, you know, they just put up the slide about how you can contact us. I think that when we're in a, a forum like this where you're you're putting comments up, sometimes it's hard and you have a, you have a lot of questions. And so that info at launchteamconsulting.com is our email, Ray and I both get it. If you have a, a question that you don't wanna put up on the, the screen uh, in the chat, um, you will be happy to answer it. And uh, if we don't know the answer, we'll try to find a resource for you. Um, the other thing Ray and I both feel is very important is continue to learn, like continue to educate yourself in good sources, you know, um, and, and, you know, we can provide some of those Ray and I both uh, read and continue to learn constantly. Things change um, and we want to provide the best training always. Um, and I think that when we talk about intent and people 
uh, caring. That was one thing that uh, my dad and my mom said when I went on board the aircraft carrier is when I was nervous, they said, you really care about people. You love people. You love your sailors. So that is so important because yes, you're going to make mistakes and you're going to learn stuff, but the fact that you care so much, that's the important thing. So, okay. So would, would you in, in address employees that push back on our, our, our over d &I efforts? Uh, so, okay. So Joy's uh, getting, getting a little water, but so like we, like we talked about earlier, I mean, em employees that push back, employees that, that, that don't want to be involved in the, in the culture. Sometimes you, it's, it's, it's addition by subtraction. Uh, you know, every single employee that you have is not going to be uh, up to in the, uh, following the rules of the culture and, and the culture that you want to create in your organization. So sometimes it has to be a, a addition by subtraction um, because you can't have someone that that's, that's poisoning the rest of your team. You know, so if, if you've made the efforts, you're trying to explain to them exactly why this is important. You explain to them that here, this is going to make us a better organization. You explain to them, would you want this on uh, to be happening to you? You know, don't you want to create a, a better environment? And uh, we understand it's frustrating. Sometimes you no know, people get upset about, you know, uh, having to do training and they think they know every, every single answer to every single question. Um, but then you know, if they don't look at it from someone else's side and say, you know, we still need to have this because it's not complete. They, do you think the organization is, is, at, is at, at its best? Um, so that's how I, I would deal with it. I mean, that's how we've dealt with it, you know, before or, or advised organizations to deal with it and say, like, okay, here, this, this is what it is. This is what our organization is going forward with. And that's how we're going to move forward because you can't go into uh, you know, a doctor and say here, you know, uh, we have this training that you have to do to maintain your certification and you have to do it. And if you don't do it, then you won't be able to practice. So that's kind of what it is. That, that, that's what our organization represents. Um, so you've addressed that. I was just gonna add that um, based on this comment about things circulating around an organization. So um, there's a comment about an anonymous comment just about things circulating around the organization where there's been an increase of, you know, unkind things that are supposed to be there. I guess they're jokes or memes or things like that, that mm -hmm. you said. And so um, I want to parallel this when I was um, a brand new, you know, officer in the Navy, it was in the no early nineties. And it was right after um, the tail hook incident. And if you're not familiar with that, um, there was a, a female aviator that was a, a assaulted basically in the hallway and a lot of training came post the tail hook incident. And so I was in a lot of this training um, about uh, gender and military and it was all focused on, on that. And I was usually the only female in that. And a lot of jokes surfaced post training to the point where I felt like I didn't want the training, you know, like I, I would almost feel like I wanted to hide in my chair because so many jokes would surface right after the one hour training. But what I found in any training over the years, and you look in blocks of um, uh, decades of training or, and you look at anything that we've gone through, and, and I talked about the chaos before clarity, Obviously, you have to address the jokes, and that needs to uh, inappropriate things that are going around need to stop in the organization. But um, I have found that sometimes it surfaces initially, but we get through that by addressing it and creating the safe environment like this. So people do, sometimes do that because they feel uncomfortable with the topic that's being talked about. Right. And so they'll send those kind of things, but that doesn't make it right. And so uh, for the back in the 90s, the jokes that were told and things usually stem from some of the guys trying to make this more comfortable. And a lot of them were told right around me because they were uncomfortable that I was, you know, all of that was addressed. And so that was the things I brought up is, you know, is the train in the 90s, is the training necessary? And now I've seen what it, what it does and the changes that have been made in the military since that. Um, so I, I, I'm very sorry that people are seeing inappropriate or offensive comments and stuff like that in your organization. And with training, that will change and that will that'll get addressed. So, someone has, has a question that they wanna uh, speak for. Yeah. And so thank you both so much. Um, I do wanna recognize that it's 3.04. So thanks everyone for joining us. Please stay, stay around. Shelly has a great question for Ray and Joy. So actually, you, you just really answered my question. I think that the 
because I was the one that put it in about, it seems like the more we talk about it, which we're trying to do as an agency, the more stuff keeps showing up. It's been pretty distressing for some of us because I guess we were unaware that that kind of feelings were, were in our agency to that degree. Now, for all we know, it's two people doing it, but um, yeah, I mean, personally, I was very upset to think that I worked with people that felt like that. That was very disturbing, but I, I do appreciate your, your comments about just, we got to keep talking about it. It's the only way to get through it. So thank you. You did answer my question. Absolutely. And Shelly, thank you so much for bringing that up because just you bringing it up addresses it to people that are not saying anything, but have been offended by it or, and for the, a lot of times for the people that send it, a lot of times the intent is not to be mean and they might be a very funny, like I have, Ray knows my twins, they're 18. And the two, the two twins are very different. One is very funny. And as he's grown up, I've been, you know, I've, I've constantly told him, okay, that's funny. But the really funny people are people that are funny without making fun of someone. And what you think making fun of someone might be different to somebody else. So be really conscious of what you're saying. And it doesn't mean that people have to be scared and feel like they're walking on eggshells you can have a great cohesive environment and i've watched the change throughout the navy because i'm still part of a lot of the naval academy organizations and to watch what i thought would never have changed back then and to see it now is like it's like night and day it's just it's a, it's amazing to see the great change and was there some heartache to get through that absolutely um but i think just addressing it and talking about it like you are and not attacking someone but trying to understand where they're coming from. Yeah, thank, thank you for the comment, yeah. Shelly, and for the question, we really appreciate it. And like my grandmother used to tell me, sometimes when you shake the tree, you know, things are gonna fall out. But that doesn't mean you're gonna <laughs> stop watering. <laughs> you keep watering it because <laughs> you're more stronger, so. And your, your grandfather, the no better, do better, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So, so thank thank you all for for yeah. being you know um, uh, uh, great panelists to, for uh, asking some great questions and and taking the time to listen to us. I hope we, something that we said resonated with you all, and uh, you know hopefully you'll be able to look and see more of our training and more of the things that we do that uh, that make a difference in organizations. Yeah, thank you so much for having us, and we want to be respectful of your time. We we can stay on if you have any other questions, but um, we know that y'all are busy and it's it's hard to stay on this for this long so <laughs> we appreciate it so yes thank you joy and ray we have i think that we've gotten a lot out of this and this will i think help us start many discussions and hopefully we'll get some great ideas about ways that national rtap can support uh transit programs around the country and we appreciate your time and energy and your perspective to help us get new perspectives too. So thank you very much. Thank you for having Absolutely. us. Thank you, thank you.